thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the Just Go Play podcast. I'm here with my co-hosts, Matt and Lisa. Um, I'm pumped. I'm really pumped about this episode today. Uh, what are we talking about, Daryl? What are we no, talking no, about today? I, listen, we, we had some good feedback from our last uh, episode uh, where we were talking about what's going to happen to sports post-COVID, uh, what are sports organizations going to do. And we have an interesting question from one of our listeners. They basically want to understand, you know, we talked about or- operationalizing sport. Um, they want to know what were we referring to when we talked about the sports structure as basically a franchisee franchise or type model. Like what were we referring to? Like, what does that mean? How is sport a business? Matt, okay, so- I, I want to, I want to start with you on that one because you're the guy who's, who had a bunch of franchisees and 20 years of success. What, what are we referring to when we're talking about operationalizing sport? Before we get to that, can I ask you both a question? Is sport a business? I'll let Lisa go. Yeah. What oh, is yeah. sport a business? One hundred percent. Of course it is. Sales, finance, marketing, entertainment. Okay, perfect. But I, and the reason I ask the question is because a lot of people will say, "Well, it's a not-for-profit. We're a not-for-profit. We're not the same as regular business. You can't compare apples to oranges." And in my estimation, you can. Anything that where there's a monetary transaction where you're paying for a service, it's called a business. So I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page, that this is a business. Otherwise, we have one of these conversations about, we, is everyone an athlete? Well, I don't want to be called that. And then we just go nowhere. So it's one of the biggest. If we're all on the same page. It's, it's the biggest. It's, we, we live in a pay-for-play society. And now we, we, it's business, for sure, 100%. Okay, perfect. Okay, so... From a, from, from a franchisor, and that's, that's what we're coming from, our experience, our collective experience. We have a franchisor, a general manager, and a franchisee. Each one of those tiers or roles has two primary responsibilities. So the franchisor in the franchise system is tasked with, number one, promoting the heck out of the business. So going and getting new business, showing everyone how great the business is and basically blowing it up as, as best they can. Their second priority and responsibility is creating a step-by-step operations manual to make it as easy as humanly possible for the franchisees to have success. And whether their, their success is gauged on money or whether it's gauged on impact, it doesn't matter. Hopefully it's both, but basically they need to have a step-by-step process. So that's the franchisor's responsibility and that's, their, that's where they are. Any questions on that from you guys? So who decides on what though, Matt? That's, that when, when you say it like that, who, who decides on the operational manual? Who decides on that manual? Good question. So the operations, the, the franchisor is usually the, the group that has the most amount of expertise. So they've been in the business the longest, they've done it, so they've got experience or they have the capital to go outside of the business to get that, that experience. So they bring it in and they create that operations manual. Now, it's not to say that the general manager and the franchisee aren't going to have innovation and new things, and, and that's fine, and that you want that. That spikes the idea. So let's take the next step, general manager. So the general manager has two primary responsibilities. Number one is to make sure the franchise are brought up to the franchisor, and if there's any problems or something, they solve it or they bring it up to the franchisor. That's the general manager. And then you have the franchisee. So the franchisee's got two primary responsibilities. Number one, service the heck out of the clients. And then number two, make sure they're operating in compliance with what the franchise or manual has set out. So that's any standard operating business. And even in a business that's not a franchise or business, you have the owner, you have a manager, and you have the employees. So the same system applies. Now, if we take that into, so, so first of all, before I go on, any questions or comments from Elisa or Daryl about that whole system? Hey, Matt. This is a fantastic model and it's the ideal version of how we can run sport from youth sport to high level sport, having that operational framework in place. You, you mentioned a really interesting word with compliance. So this is where a lot of times I see this breaking down is 
anyone, whether it's a national sport organization or like you mentioned, someone, the organization with the most experience drops off this framework and says, here you go. Maybe there's some training with it. Maybe there isn't. Maybe there's some resources. Maybe there aren't. But the regulation around how is this delivered, like that's a part that I feel like we really need to address around compliance is if it's not happening, well, what happens? Because if we know if it's not happening, the end product, the end result is going to suffer. So if it is happening, if it's a good system and it's delivered and implemented properly, as you always say, then it's great. And it, and it has the potential to be great. But if it's not implemented, if it's not executed, if it's not um, complied with, to use that word, then how do we help make sure that that happens? And understanding the realities of youth sports, these guys don't have the same budgets that we need them to have. So how can they work around that? Yeah, it's a great question. So, and before we get to that question, let's talk about a couple of things. The reality of, let's take a, a regular business, owner, manager, employee. If the employees don't do what they're told, they get a pink slip and they're fired. If you're a franchisor, general manager, franchisee, and you're not operating in compliance, what happens is you get a fixturing period where you get a letter and you've got a set amount of days to fix that issue. And if you don't, you are in breach of your agreement and you lose your agreement. So really key, that's how it works in business. Now you're right, that's not how it works in sport. And that's gonna probably get into the whole host of conversational points that we've got today around really, what are we trying to do today? I think answering the question is how do we run proper business in sport? Because sport is business, but it's not run properly and it's not run in the confines. First of all, the first gap is that there is no operations manual that's been created by any governing body of sport into how to engage athlete development in your club. There's none. Trust me. We've looked. We've checked. I know both of you have. And it, there's not one in the United States. There's not one in Canada. What they have done is a fantastic job of taking the academia and creating ADM in the United States and LTAD um, prescriptions in Canada that say this is what ha should happen in, at the age and stage appropriate levels under number one, the technical tactical, and number two, the physical skills. And they're even have some recommendations for social and emotional. That's very prescriptive, but that doesn't tell anyone how to run the business of sport. That tells people what they should, why they should be having age and stage appropriate skills and what those age and stage appropriate skills should be. What it doesn't say is I am Jenny or Johnny community member, and I am now the president of a minor hockey, baseball, basketball association. How do I engage my stakeholders, which are athletes, parents, officials, coaches, and sport organization administration, and let's call them educators, whether it's strength and conditioning or physical educators, or how do I engage those six stakeholders and put them together and come along with my process? Nobody has ever articulated that and the how-to phase. So before we even get to answering the question, which your question is great, on how do we hold people in compliance, we haven't even provided them with an operations manual yet. So let's start there. If we're looking, Daryl, back to your question on the franchisor, general manager, franchisee, that franchisor should be the Canadian Olympic Committee or the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committees, or it can be the national governing bodies or the national sport organizations, or it can be the provincial sport organizations or the AAU or the NCAA, but somebody has to take the lead. It doesn't matter who it is. It matters that it is because basically what we have at the, and you, we've talked about this all the time, at uh, the foundation of our sport pyramid, we have the most self-interested and least educated people running, as Elisa has alluded to, with no checks and balances. And then we're wondering why our sport system is faltering. Daryl, what do you think? So what I'm hearing is we need leadership. So it starts with leadership. I, okay, so if I'm a sports organization, what's my first priority? Like what, what's the first thing I, I got to go out there and do now? If, again, let's, let's talk about, bring it back to present day, uh, post COVID now. What's the first thing an organization should, or, or should they be doing right now and while they have time, while they're waiting for this COVID period to be over? What's the first yeah, thing? The first thing that people need to be doing as organizations is they need to be thinking about who are the right people for the right roles right away. So right people, right roles right away. Too often, we have two things that go wrong with community sport builders. Number one, 
is we don't actually hire builders, we hire maintainers. And I'm gonna talk about the difference between builders and maintainers. Maintainers are the people that get into a sport organization and wanna keep their job because it offers some prestige or maybe some money or it gives them something to do. And basically they wanna maintain. So they walk in, they see a vision, mission statement, they go, okay, we gotta just do this status quo. Hey, do you wanna make these changes? No, 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 we can't do that because if we do that and it fails, we're gonna look bad. And so those are maintainers. They get in and they maintain. Uh, they want to go, yep, check the box. We got the anti-bullying link on the website. Yep, check the box. I attended that form shower summit and heard the same thing I've heard for the last 16 years in a row. They're just checking boxes. We don't want people that check boxes. We're in a time, especially Daryl, post-COVID, we need to build. We need to rebuild. We need to rebuild trust in the sports system that it's, it is for all. Uh, we need the diversity, the inclusion, all these great things that we talk about we now need the leadership to execute. So that's going to happen with builders. And in my opinion, just like in regular business, those builders should be judged, and this moves on to Elisa's comment, on very specific attract, ret retain, and grow metrics. Because all your job is and your responsibility is from a youth sport organization is to attract new members, maintain and retain the existing members, and then make sure that there's growth. And the, in my opinion, there should be a three-year max for that because we know most parents spend five years, the duration of their kid playing sports in on boards and doing that stuff. And that's where things get stale. If you have three years and you're doing an audit after three years of, of what you're based on something tangible to Elisa's point, how many uh, new, new members have you attracted? What's the retaining mechanism for existing members and how has this, you've grown your, your community? We wouldn't have a lot of these issues that we're having because that, would be the level of accountability number one number two and then i'll zip it is we got to stop doing what we do in terms of hiring uh you know members volunteers because remember Daryl, your favorite term just because you're a volunteer doesn't give you license to suck at what you do we have to be way better and and daryl i know you're going to speak to this volunteer issue because as a coach and as someone who's tried to make change you've come up against it and lisa i know you have but what we got to get away from at AGMs is, is saying, hey, listen, who wants to volunteer for this position? And then people put their hands up, they check and see if you've got a pulse and, they, and, and then you're in charge of atom development or player safety or something you don't even know if you have qualifications for. And I just want to give an example, apples to apples. So if we, we just had this great party a couple of years ago in Vancouver, British Columbia, and it was called the Olympics. And basically there was a whole volunteer base that was needed for the Olympics. Do you think for one second that they just randomly selected people with no training protocol, with no support and not finding the right people for the right roles to just do tasks? Of course they didn't. They would never, ever do that. So it, we're tired of hearing the excuse that we can't hold people to account because they're volunteers, because that just tells us that we have not done a good job of creating that onboarding and operating system for those people. Over to you guys. Matt, dude, this is great. I, and I feel your passion because you, you're hogging up the talk, man. But that, <laughs> I feel your passion. Lisa, are people ready for this? Are organizations ready for this? Like what Matt said is beautiful, but do you think organizations are ready for this? Please. One of the interesting things that I think that we see right now, and I think you guys have all seen the same thing, is when you go in and you're talking to a sport organization, or even, never mind a sport organization, even there's recreational organizations out there that want to figure out ways to retain new members. Because really, in one sense, that's what it's all about. Like, how do we get, either retain our current membership, or increase participation with new members that we haven't seen before? And they're all, the buy-in, when you go into them, you say, hey, you know, how do you guys feel about your current operations or the things you want to change? What do you think you want to see for the future that you're not seeing now? And all of them are bought into the idea of, of course, we need to really revolutionize how we're doing things because sport is not how it was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Sport has changed dramatically. And now kids' attentions are diverted into many, many different ways. And we've talked about one of them, we mean esports, but other things are taken over as well. So, so I think the buy-in is there that they want to do something. And I sit around tables with, with different organizations and they're all bought in. But when it comes down to the work, when it comes down to what Matt was saying, this is what you have to do. You have to implement this or that. Then things fall apart and go, well, I can't. I'm just a volunteer. I don't have any time. And I'm not downplaying the realities of volunteering. 
if I'm a parent and I'm, I'm doing this, I don't, I have no clue about the sport. Like say I was, I was coaching my kids synchronized swimming team. I have no clue how to do that, but I'm the only one there. I'm the only one who put my hand up because I want my kids to be able to participate. But if I don't know what to do, and if I have no time because I work a, a 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. kind of job, how am I supposed to do this? And that's our job to help support them and the organization's job to help support them. But I understand the realities. We just can't use that as a, okay, that's going to stop the conversation now. So yes, I think sport organizations are all willing and wanting this, but the reality of actually doing it is something we need more robust support around. I love it because you're so right about that volunteer. And I, and I think it comes down to dollars. Like, like you said, they can't pay you to do that synchronized swimming. So they need to find someone who's got some energy and, 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 and willing to do it because that's what they're, they're cut. They're checking the box as Matt said, but I know from working with some different organizations that when I said, Hey, you guys got to get these coaches on the same page. They're not on the same page as you guys. Like your mission vision is up here. You're saying this, but when I talk to these coaches, they're not on the same page as you. And their thing is, Oh man, he's been here a long time. He volunteers his time. You know, they don't want to rock the boat. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is, this is, I think is our biggest challenge is as Matt said, you can't be in that position if you're not qualified or if you're not willing to learn what, what's expected or, 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 or stay with the, the mission and vision of the, the, the organization. I think that is a huge problem in our, in our, our different organizations. We, we need leaders that are okay to tell people that, yo, you can't do that. You can't, well, you can't do that anymore or that this is how we're doing things from now on. And when that happens, I think that's when we're going to see some changes in these organizations. Yeah, don't, don't you think it's uh, interesting that, well, listen to what we're talking about. So if just take the context of, I go to a team and I'm listening to the coach's speech at the beginning of the year, what kind of things do they say? This is a team. We all have roles and responsibilities. It's not about you. Make sure if you have questions, you communicate. We have to work together. You know, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. It's funny that we say that and espouse it downwards, but we don't actually do a good job of it at the governing body level, the governance level, or our administration level. So we're saying one thing and we're doing the complete opposite. So, you know, it's a great point that, that both of you guys make. So moving on from that, because Daryl, you kind of, we, we, we want to give the listeners something to do. So first of all, write people, write roles right away. Second thing, and I just want to say it now because Elisa reminded me of it, do your homework do the market research and stop guessing or assuming that your stakeholders, your parents, your kids, your officials, your coaches, stop guessing at what they want, ask them. And that's the second thing that needs to be done is that market research or uh, Elisa refers to it as an environmental scan or questionnaires. And a lot of times we've been, and the three of us have been working with organizations and they go, well, you know, we got a really low, uh, return on the participation for our questionnaires. And I go, okay, well, what does your questionnaire look like? And inevitably it is something to the effect of, did we as an organization deliver what we said we were going to deliver? Okay. What has that got to do with any stakeholder expectation? Like we have to do questionnaires. Uh, you know, we, we've got to be really specific. They need to be stakeholder specific. Um, the, if they're not stakeholder, we know what the stakeholders want. We know what kids want. We discussed that last time, fun, friends, fair play, friendly competition, finish the season. We know what parents want. We know what officials and coaches want. One to 10, are we delivering it? You rate your past and current experience. If we're not asking those stakeholders early and often about what's happening, then what we're doing is like somebody pulling up to a Dairy Queen and asking for a milkshake and a hamburger they pull up to the window and they give them a ham sandwich and a glass of water. And we're like, and they're like, what the hell, what the hell is this? It's a ham sandwich and a glass of water. You don't like that? Don't come here. Like nobody would ever do that in business, but we do that in the sports sector. We're handing out ham sandwiches and glasses of water because we think that that's what the people want. Ask what people want. Uh, um, you know, especially, especially, you know, after, after C-19, and make sure we have to make sure what we're delivering. And Lisa, and I know you've got some good insight into in, in, that because you've got a lot of experience. So what do you think? 
I got a question for you. I want to ask. I want to ask both of you this question because I have my own uh, impression of this, impression of this. But I want to ask you guys. When we do a survey, when we ask, you know, we're going to put out some information. We're going to put out some questions to gather some information. And the idea behind gathering that information is that we're going to use it to then act. We're either going to change or we're going to keep doing things the way that we've done them because our membership says that's what they like. Do you think that people who put out these surveys are doing it to check a box or are doing it because they truly want the information to know what they need to do next? Because from what I see, a lot of times we're doing it to check a box. And when it comes back with that, oh, we only got you know, five people respond to our survey we sent out to 200 people in our membership, that's kind of the end of it. And I'm wondering, well, did you really want that information to begin with? And if you did get a whole bunch of information, if you got 97% back, if you revamped how you did this and you got 97% return rate, which is, I know, ridiculous, but say you got that, and then you had to do something with that information, is that really what they want? Because if not, then you're putting out a survey, you're putting out a questionnaire that you really don't want to have come back and you don't want to change. You're just doing it to check that box. Have you guys seen anything? Like, do you guys have opinions on that? Am I way off? I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep in my, my answer will be short. It's check a box because nine, nine out of 10 times they'll, they'll get that feedback and they'll be like, what do they know? If, from a parent, they, what do they know? Like, I've been here. I've done this before. Like, that parent's just unhappy or doesn't doesn't understand you know what what hockey or soccer what it's all about so i think they they do it because it's it's a nice gesture but i don't think they they take feedback a lot of people don't take feedback well they look at it as they take it personal or they take it as criticism but feedback as i learned from a man matt is feedback you know what i mean learn from it you know and and use it it's an so opportunity. Actually, yeah, I agree with Daryl I, and you, Elisa. It's an opportunity to improve. And that's exactly what people are doing is they're, they're checking boxes. Because why would on earth would you send a questionnaire at the end of the season when you can do nothing about what's happened? There should be a questionnaire at the beginning of the season and that gets people's input from the previous season, mid-season to evaluate what's going on so that changes can be made so that you don't keep dragging out bad stuff and you can pivot and improve. And then there should be one at the end of the season as a meaningful wrap up. And at least you're right, because why the hell would people start? Why, people just disengage because basically it's disingenuous. You're, you're giving a questionnaire. We all know you don't want the answers to because every time we suggest something and we know 20 parents that have suggested the same thing, you ain't changing anything. So, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And that if you're going to do market research, do market research. You want to get the number. As Daryl, you said, this is not for the purposes of of personal good or bad this is for the purposes of coach education this is for the purposes of what are we doing well this is for the purposes of where do we need help and support otherwise why are you wasting your time i think it's a comical that you know the coach associations um in our countries uh, basically they've got all this coaching stuff and i, I go well, what's predicating this coach education like i understand evidence and knowledge but is it just all on the technical tactical and physical like you've never even asked your constituents, you've never asked your primary customers how you're doing. So what, how, how are you coming up with these pay to have more coaches? So the whole system needs to be aligned around that if we want a greater buy-in. I think that's, that's our point is, is to get greater buy-in. And on that point, Matt, I know you, you refer to mission and vision a lot. And, and I, when I think mission and vision, I think those are the things that help with the culture. Um, can you explain how you, you know, you come up with mission and vision and why it's so important? Because when I talk to people and I ask them what their mission and vision is, it's just words that somebody put out because somebody asked for it on a business plan. Yeah. They, don't, they don't actually use it or they don't live by it. So why is mission and vision? I'm going to put this to both of you guys. Why do you guys think mission and vision is so important in, in terms of helping the culture, uh, in terms of helping these organizations have you know, this stay on the same page alignment. Like, can you guys elaborate on that? Elisa, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Matt, you've been one of the biggest proponents of mission vision that I've seen in this journey around, you know, from school to work to sports. And the idea around mission vision is really important because it guides you on where you're going to go and it keeps you focused along the journey. So you can get pulled off into so many different ways and you can lose track and lose focus of where you originally said you wanted to go. And again, as a group, not just individually, as a group, 
you said you wanted to go here. And when something inevitably along the way pulls you off in another path or another direction, you need that mission vision to come back and ground you. You also need it for a reason when people say to you, well, how come you're not doing this? And how come you're not doing that? And I want to focus on this. You, re you refocus and you say, well, this is why. This is our mission vision. So when a parent comes to me and says, you know, how come we're not, how come we're not winning more? And I, and I can use that mission vision and say, well, our mission vision is here. Like one of the things you always say is finish the season better than we started. That doesn't necessarily mean we're just going to focus on winning. We're going to work on the individuals. We're going to develop their character. We're going to develop their teamwork, their, their durability. We're going to develop a whole bunch of things. Winning is a byproduct. And that's clearly laid out in our mission vision. If your mission vision is winning, okay, I'm going to bench your kid because he's not producing the numbers we need to win. And so don't come to me and say, why aren't we winning? Or why isn't my kid playing? Because I told you our mission vision from the very beginning was winning. And if you don't ascribe to that, find another team, which is what you should do. If you don't believe in the mission vision that team has, then you need to find another team and you need to hold that team accountable to delivering on that mission vision. Yeah. Parents, parents, parents should ask that at the beginning of the year. 100%. But I don't think they do. But, but Matt? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's the foundation. And I use the analogy of building a house. Every single house on the planet that stands the test of time is built on what? A foundation. That foundation is cement and concrete. There's no magical formula. Yeah, sure, there's some new innovation, but 99% is cement and concrete. Um, to me, that's the mission and vision. And that's, Daryl, that's the culture. That's the culture and ethos of an organization is the concrete. You don't have that, you got nothing. So what's next on the house is the framework. And that's wood or steel. And, you know, and that's where your, your, your terms of reference, your values, that, that's where that stuff comes in, in terms of the organizational setting. And then where all the nuance is, is in the furniture, the fixtures and the finishings. And, and what we're not saying is that it's a cookie cutter formula, but what we are saying is that there are a few really foundational and fundamental items that need to go into growing and establishing a solid home, a solid business, a solid team, a solid anything. And you're right, Daryl, that culture, which is often overlooked because people go, oh, it's not right. But you look at some of the best authors in the world, Simon Sinek, Carol Dweck, uh, Jim Collins, Stephen Covey, what did they all write about? The habits uh, and these foundational habits, Tony Robbins, like they all speak the same language and everyone laps that up, but then we just don't turn around and we don't know how to do it in a sports setting. So you know, we always, it, when we advise sport organizations, we say, don't ever let anything leave your table if you haven't covered the five W's and one H. Why, what, when, where, who, and most importantly, how. And what we often see is the why and the what, very well articulated. And then everyone goes, yeah, got it done. And they send it out. Okay, well, where is it happening? When's it happening through the season? Who's doing it? And, and how do we actually onboard people? So every time some, it's like solving all these sport organizations that think they can solve the problem through marketing and communications is laughable. You can never, you will, I'm going to go, I'm going to say this two times. You will never solve a issue with a marketing and communications advocacy tactic. Again, you will never solve a deep rooted youth sport issue through marketing and communications alone tactic. You just won't do it. You can advocate till the cows come home until you're ready to actually roll up your sleeves, pour the concrete, set the footings, and go through that process. You're never, ever, ever going to create meaningful change. And, and you know, you're just going to be in this perpetual race to reclaim registration. And that's what's going to happen in, in, with, the, with the average and poor organizations after COVID, is they're just going to be in a race to reclaim registration. And we need to hoard registration, or I'm not going to have a job. They're not going to think about the right people in the right roles. They're not going to do their market research. They're just going to go in and waste a, a, a very, you know, a, what's the saying? Don't waste a, a good crisis. Um, so yeah, that's it. Without a culture, you've got nothing. And Lisa makes a really good point. That's, that's exactly what should attract you and attract athletes and parents. And that should be readily available, readily available known and appear in all the language all how we, how things are run, how adversity is handled, how issues are handled. And again, if you don't walk the talk in terms of your culture, if you're just putting it up there, or you're just trying to abide by someone else's vision statement that was two years ago, and you're not updating it, you're going to have more problems than, than not. I want to I add one more thing onto that. Um, 
especially in, in environments where there's a high turnover rate. So usually we're getting in, you know, parents are coming in and out as coaches and, and uh, volunteers or, or officials even. When you have a high turnover rate in your environment, it's really important to have those foundational documents to say, here's what we're all about. If somebody comes in and you go, okay, you know, yeah, here's your clipboard and your whistle and your plays, go ahead out and, and figure it out. Which unfortunately, and again, I don't want to throw any sport under the bus because I know there's a lot of good intentions out there and sometimes it just doesn't match what we want to see. But if you have those documents, when you have that turnover, that onboarding process is so much more slick and it's so much more effective to be able to have that person come into a fold and also have them understand this is the standard in our organization. So we want you to rise to that standard. We're not letting you come in here unsupported, without any resources, and without any information about who we are. We want to bring you in as a teammate in this journey, and here's what you need to know. And then we're going to help you deliver on this, which is what we set out. So having that information for the onboarding process in those, those high turnover environments is really, really important. And I've seen it go the other way. And people come in, deer in the headlights going, I, you know, I showed up and I got one piece of paper and I don't know what to do. And then they want to bounce. They don't want to stick around because they feel so unsupported and they feel silly now that they're on the field or as part of this group that they don't know anything about. So it helps both sides, helps them want to be a part of your team. And it helps you retain those people as part of your team in the way that you want to see your vision and mission delivered. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point, man. I'm listening to this, and, and I'm just curious right now. I, I wonder if organizations, what, what, what they're doing right now. Are they, are they sitting at home? Are they in meetings? What are they talking about right now? Like, are they worried about registration? Are they worried about, you know, what was broken before and what they can fix now? Like, this is a huge opportunity, like, as if we've talked about over the last two podcasts, to, you know, clean up what wasn't working. Like, do you guys think right now, sports organizations are sitting planning and 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 talking about this stuff and saying hey this didn't work before we never want this to happen again this is our chance to get rid of the cancer or the stuff that wasn't working you you guys think that's happening i'm a realist daryl so i'm going to say 90 10 <laughs> no 10 90 percent, no 10 percent, yes and and what's good about the 10 percent to spin that into a positive is that those 10 percent people are going to start looking at them and going, Hey, what did you do? And what happened? Um, because again, this boils down to, to leadership and this is a leadership gap and opportunity. So if you've got a leader of an organization, whether they're a national body and they're listening and all oh, these guys don't know all oh, this, but like, what do most people say? Like you talked about when you, when they get feedback, that's not me, not us. What do people say when they get a book? This book, and it's critical. This book would be so good for somebody else. We don't actually, again, and I go back to that whole thing about what coaches, what you tell your kids when you're a coach, but it seems to be different from how we behave when we, we become coaches and part of an organization as adults. And, you know, a lot of, you got, I know you got some feedback, Daryl, and so did I about the podcast. And it said, you know, this isn't just about sport, you guys. You guys are talking about life and, and all everything that, you just happen, it happens to be through a sport lens, but the message that you're giving is life. Like family should have a culture. Um, school should have a culture. Like it, it, this applies to everything. It's not just a youth sport system, but for the purposes of the youth sport system, I would say that probably a large percent percentage are, are worried about getting back to solvency and their number one um, path to that is through registration fees. And so my worry is that we're going to see even more cannibalism of the sports system, um, more capitalism, because we, we, we don't tend to think. The fact that the world's leading experts in health are saying, stay home. They are experts in health. And we go, nope, we want to get back to work because we need to make money should be a pretty clear indication of where our overall psychology is for the masses. Wow. Lisa, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, I've been talking to a couple of sport organizations, uh, just checking in with them and some of the communities I work in and, and asking them how they're going. And every time we have a meeting, I ask, you know, how is, how is COVID affecting your reality today and what you guys are planning for the future? And to Matt's point, a lot of them are thinking, you know, we want to be able to have our, our, our operations going in the future and our funding might not be coming. 
someone brought up good points uh, in Canada anyways, that they might not get their gaming funding. So if they don't get their gaming funding, they're going to have to shut down their season potentially, unless they can find other sources of revenue, which is a good discussion to have around, do you only focus on one source of revenue to keep your lights on? And so how other, what other ways can you look at? Because if you don't diversify your portfolio, my friend, you are going to be in trouble. And so we can have some of those conversations and, and prepare for what are some inevitables that might happen? And then how do we mitigate those today? So let's have that conversation because everyone's worried about it. But if your goal is to keep the lights on, think about now, how do you prepare for what's going to come? Because unfortunately, nobody knows. So I think to Matt's point, that's what a lot of people are focused on is just damage control and hoping that they're going to be able to continue to compete. But I think we have more opportunity to plan for it. And they are, they are planning. I don't, I don't want to say that, you know, they're sitting there just waiting for the, the sky to fall. But uh, I don't think the conversations are there about let's really dig back into our foundational documents. I haven't seen that yet. Well, I, <clears throat> I, I think for sure they're, they're, they're thinking about it. And, and I know from personally from people I've talked to, finance is one of the biggest thing they're worried about right now. As you guys, both you guys have touched on, finance is huge. Like how are kids going to afford to play sports? Right. So again, me, that's, that's me thinking silo. Like what if, and I'm just throwing this out there. What if hockey and soccer got together and said, Hey, why don't we do something together guys? Do you think that would ever happen? Hell no. I don't think so. Because again, back to our silos, we keep talking about everybody working together collectively, but it's never happening. It's not happening. I don't think everyone is worried about how they're going to eat. And at the end of the day, this is, this is where I think this is an opportunity to say, hey, this soccer club and this hockey club and this baseball club, we should unite and become one club or, or, or share resources. That is something that, and I go, that's a, that's a million, that's another podcast. I think that's another podcast, but that, that's where I, I can see everyone can help each other. But right now everyone's scared. Like, you know, I know soccer, if they don't have a season, like you can't go a whole year without seeing people. Like that means what's going to happen next year. Hockey's like, they're, they're the same. What do you, what do you mean? We can't, we might not have a season next year. All of them, all of them are in the same boat. I was, I, I was wondering last thing, if, you know, Matt, you talked about different organizations at the top leadership. What if professional organizations were at the top and and were responsible for their community, you know, in terms of development and sport development. What, what do you guys think of that? And I, I, I said a lot. I said a lot. Talk to everything I just said there. Yeah, no, I think it's a good, it's in theory, it's good. Cause I think everyone loves the idea of collective impact right down to the point where their, their monetary um, nut is compromised. So collective impact sounds fantastic right to the point where, wait a second, does this mean I don't have a job? And I think you've touched on the points, Daryl, of let's talk about before COVID, because before COVID, we already had an issue, and it was the bifurcation of sport, the haves and the have-nots, the pay-to-play. It's not fun, people dropping out. So before any issue even happened, there was already a deep-seated issue. What this did was just go, holy smokes, this is just, now Now it's way worse. Now, now we can't ignore it, because we have to restart. So it's going to be really interesting because, again, um, you know, when you ask the question, do you think a lot of what, what, how do you think organizations at the youth sport level are going to respond? You know, they're going to respond based on on themselves. And, and so that's the first point. Second point that you made that I that I liked was the how do professional sport organizations invest in this? Do you know? Do they have a responsibility? We we are, we do know that if you played a sport, you're you're six times more likely to be a fan of sport. So that's been proven. And so it is important that they, that they create opportunities. And I think a lot of sport organizations great try. Great opportunity right now. I just don't think they, they're, they, 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 they consult the academic community. No offense to the academic community whatsoever. But academic community, what should we do? Well, come on. It, 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 if you're an academic and you studied things in school, you go get some entrepreneurs around your table, go get some market research people around your table, go get some behavior change people around that table and talk to a diverse table. Um, don't just talk to one person who is a guru and the self-proclaimed guru of all of this to get your answer because you're not going to get it. I mean, I think 
you know, the, the professional sport organizations have made it pretty clear that they're beholden to their stakeholders, which is their, 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 their bosses, their, their shareholders of the organizations. And that's not wrong. Again, they're the franchisees. They're doing a great job from that franchisor general manager franchisee model. Is it their job and responsibility to, you know, fun, uh, nourish this grassroots or is it to promote the hell out of the business and, and provide the operations manual? I'd say they haven't done a good job of providing the operations manual because it always goes back to a Marcoms, a marketing and communications. Let's do this advocacy campaign. Let's do these and throw some basketballs out there. Okay, is that actually doing the job or is that the easiest checkbox you can check to say that you've invested in youth sport? We know the answer. Matt, I wanna to touch on two things you said. One, you mentioned entrepreneurial connection. So bringing some entrepreneurs to the table, both of you guys, superb entrepreneurs. And I know both of you have told me there's been times when you lie awake at night in a cold sweat thinking, how am I going to pay the bills tomorrow because of one thing or another, especially now. I mean, Daryl, you're still oh, in gosh. fitness business. And so, you know, you're wondering like, what do I do? And what do entrepreneurs do who continue through all these things? They have to figure out how to pivot and reinvent themselves. And so if sport is, is too arrogant, to think that we don't have to do that because we're Canada. Everybody loves hockey. We don't have to change because we just have, we're too big to fail, which we know has so many flaws. And so how, how can we bring some more of that entrepreneurial learning and flexibility to be able to say, here's a crisis. I've dealt with crises before and here's how I'm gonna address it and move on from it. And it might mean changing. It might mean letting people go. It might mean changing our structure. It might mean reinventing how we operate and with our membership, but it means staying alive. And the market research, everything we've talked about is going to help you along that journey. So I, I think that piece is so undervalued, but to have that entrepreneurial mindset and bring some entrepreneurs into your, to your table and say, what can we do to reinvent how we do things so that we stay alive through this crisis? Is, is superb and anyone who wants that information there's lots of entrepreneurs who are willing to support different groups um the other thing i wanted to mention is you said you know for the professional sports it's a great great idea daryl and i had some ideas around like can you imagine if there was a multi-sport organization that had all of those sports that it, it operated and it supported and they worked in tandem together how cool would that be especially if it had the, the coolness factor of having the pro sports teams attached to it Everybody loves seeing when a pro sports team comes and supports, you know, the kids at the grassroots. It's just, it makes the connection, that wow factor, just really pump it out. And then Matt, you said something that I've heard all the time. Well, you know, whose job is it? Whose job is it to do that? Is it their job? Is it that person's job? Is it an NSO's job? And that, that conversation needs to get addressed to say somebody has to pick up this ball and run with it. Because right now, it, everybody's able to say, that's not really my job. Someone else will take care of that. And that is not working. Someone needs to take ownership and make this their freaking job. Yeah, great point. Who's, who is that? <laughs> Whose job is it to make sure everyone gets this? Yeah, and that comes back down to regulation too. Because if you're, if you're taking ownership for it, I have to make sure it's working. I'm going to be held accountable to make sure that that's delivered. So if I'm a pro sports team and I'm being held accountable to make sure that my grassroots coaches are delivering on our operational framework, then I'm responsible and I can get axed if it's not happening. So how do you manage along the way? And that is a really, you talk about leadership, that takes, that takes a, a leader with big cojones. Yeah, so Daryl, that's a great, great point, Lisa. And Daryl, whose job is it? Well, let's start striking off whose job it's not. It's not the Minister of Sport for Canada or the US because we don't have one. So that's really easy. Um, it's usually in a franchise uh, or French, a general manager franchisee um, role, it's the responsibility of everyone. So it's the responsibility of the franchisor to do the, do the job and, and create and continue to build out that operations framework. It's the responsibility of the general manager to make sure that the compliance is happening. And it's the responsibility of that owner operator of the franchisees to make sure that they're doing it too. So that's three, three tiers. Um, what you hear in the sports system, to Lisa's point, often is, well, that's not our job. We're the, we're the Olympic Committee. That's not our job. We're the NGB. That, that, that happens on the ground. Well, all you hear is excuses about whose job it's not. Um, so, so, again, this boils back to our leadership conversation. If there's leadership at every tier, then there's the connection and there's the pathway. 
and it's hard to do because you know I we talked to Rugby Canada they've got you know every single district's got a board of directors every single board of directors has got an idea there's just way too much glut there's not enough organizational alignment um, it's it's too bloated and you know hopefully and I hate to say it uh, and, and I don't mean to be disrespectful when I do say this I hope that some people aren't able to come back and that we thin that out and the cream rises to the top so we can get back to having that organizational alignment where we don't need uh, you know 62 boards of directors to govern one sport in a, inside a province it doesn't it's never going to work that way it's going to be sorry it's going to be a lot harder and more difficult to work that way so i think it's part of everyone's responsibility and i go back to the same thing whose job is it to have a successful season on this sport team whatever sport it is it's all of our responsibilities if we really wanted to be if if we were really serious in in north america about a, a common vision and sharing a common vision for sports every single sport organization's vision would be as many as possible as long as possible in the best environment possible every single one but it's not it's to create the best hockey players ringette players football players soccer players it's not that's not they don't share a connect vision so that there's not even any alignment with what they're saying and what they're doing and how they're positioning themselves in the market could you imagine a country where that was every single sport organization's vision right there that 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 starts the whole thing right there that's the culture that you want right there well that goes back to the right back to the beginning well sports is a business we need somebody to be a leader and and bring it all together but what you just said you know maybe you should be the minister of sport yeah i probably get assassinated with a soccer ball or hockey puck. you'd be assassinated for sure buddy yeah, there'd be a lot less there'd be a lot there would be a lot more getting done with a lot less people i can assure you yeah, yeah. i would never be in public with you thank you thank you for that straight bullet but you know what the, but but the as you said the person who does do that and make make a, a stand it he's got to have some balls and he's got to, he's, he's not afraid to change because yeah, he, he's yeah. got some uh He's got some obstacles to overcome. And, and, you know, as we've said in one of our old podcasts, you know, we got to get over that. This is how we've always done it because that talk is dead now. The people that are going to survive the COVID, you know, are, you know, C-19, they're going to have to be solid. You got, you got to offer value to these people because people are not, they're shopping now with different eyes when they come back, when they're shopping their kids around or they're, they've had time to think about, what's coming forth now, you know? So I, I think we're, we're going to see a big change. And I think, I don't know if people are going to be ready for this, but the, it, it's definitely the, the thing that's for, and you, and you said, Matt, not everybody's going to get out. Not everyone's going to come through. Mm -hmm. We're going to lose some people. So on that note, next first step, steps. Next first, step. steps first steps, first steps, yeah, first steps are uh, right people, right roles right away. Like, and I'm really glad you asked that question. It's really easy to, to think about who are the, don't, go find the people. Don't put up, ask someone in a room who wants to be the director of finance without a CRA or marketing or, or, or sorry, uh, uh, accounting background. Go and find the person in that club that has an accounting background. You know that information and go, we need you. Um, because if you want something done, give it to a busy person. They'll get it done really quickly. So right people, right roles right away. Second, do your homework, environmental scan, market research, ask the questions that can give you real tangible answers. Get those answers numerically so that you can compare them. At the beginning of the year, we ranked a two in this. Now we rank a four. Our goal is to rank a six. That is how to you know, put together a good business strategy for the year and then look back and say, yes, we did, no, we didn't, what, what do we need to do? And then, and then establish the culture. So these are three steps. And the reason you can't go and establish your culture first, and this is a great commentary and, a, and, and conversation with Elisa and I, and, and Michael Jennings actually, is because if you, if you put the culture and you do all that work in your culture, but you haven't done the market research, then you're bringing the culture that you want, <laughs> but you're not necessarily getting the input from all your stakeholders. So that's a fine balance of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, if you're not going to put, if you're going to do that and do your own culture first and your own strat plan and meeting first, no problem, but then be ready to revisit it after you get the information back from your stakeholders, after you do that environmental scan, you need that information. So whether it comes first or second, it, 
those things are pretty closely tied to one and two. So those would be uh, my first steps. Lisa, anything else? Yeah, I want to add um, in this journey, we need to be humble and we need to be humble enough to be able to change. A lot of sport comes back to tradition, to your points. You know, this is the way we've already do, always done things. Be humble and ask for help, which we're not good at doing, and help from the right people. So, so we mentioned those entrepreneurs. Go out and find some entrepreneurs and ask them for how do you pivot out of a hard situation? What can we do differently based on here's the information of our market research, here's our membership, here's our challenges pre-COVID, and now the ones we foresee after post-COVID. Invest some time and money. And I know money is tight right now, but there's a way to find opportunity. And maybe it's not dollars. Maybe it's something that you can leverage with them. What do they want? That barter system is really important. And if you can give an entrepreneur a platform to work with your constituents, maybe that's something that they want. But be humble in their search for how do we look to pivot? Because I think we're, we're too, a lot of us are too arrogant to say, you know, I need some help in this, especially as organizations, to reach out to people and reach out to people you haven't reached out to before. Don't go to the same well find a new one because this is not an environment we've ever seen before. We need to look in places we've never looked before for support. I love That's it. What I add. Love that. I, would, I just want to add and sum it up. Matt said something earlier about foundation and building a house. I think we need a reno. Sports, the organizations, <laughs> they need a reno. And if, if you were going to go out and, and have a reno, you would inquire who was the best guy that I could get, who had a great plan because what you had before wasn't working. So, it, you know, finding the right people and, and, and not going cheap because if you don't fix this house properly, it's going to wash away the shore. So it, it's time for a, a good reno in, for the sports organizations. And if that doesn't happen, you're, you're going to have random results. Your house might stay, stand up, or it might not. So, you know, best example today, it, for these sports organization and building a business, you got to have a strong foundation. And if your foundation isn't strong right now, you got to go back and fix it. Yeah. So, yeah. so good, Daryl. And otherwise the same old shit. I mean, we're yeah. so sick and tired. And, and that's what people were telling us before this. They were sick and tired of SOS. They wanted something new and something different. So like you've said, and taking a really high road and positive approach is use it as an opportunity. Yeah. 100%. Guys, great discussion today, man. I, Listen, I, I sometimes I forget I'm 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 on the show with you guys. I just spectator. Like awesome conversation. You know, if you like this podcast, share this with your friends, guys. We we want more people to hear this. Coaches, parents, all the stakeholders. Like we want this to be shared in your community. Please share. Um, and guys, on that note, just go play. Take care, guys. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs>